You're tuned in, tuned up, and ready to go. Welcome to Ria's Ham Shack, a weekly conversation about amateur radio, shortwave listening, and radio tech. Hosted by Ria Jiram, N2RJ, and heard weekly on WRMI Legends Shortwave. And now, here's your host, Ria. What's up, everybody? I am Ria, N2RJ, right here on the fabulous WRMI Legends, and this is Ria's Ham Shack. I'd like to say thanks to the entire crew at WRMI Legends. You know who you are, Ted Randall, Holly, Jeff Lawrence, and all the fabulous DJs at uh, WRMI Legends. And, of course, the crew at WRMI, who keeps us on the air and keeps the tubes glowing, Jeff White and his crew down in there in Okeechobee, Florida. Well, this week, let me talk a little bit about where I've gone and what they mean to amateur radio in general and what that means for you. I'm going to talk a little bit about generative AI, yes, chat GPT and all that stuff. And are we losing the art of thinking? Are we losing the art of communication in ham radio? I will, of course, take your questions and answers. You can send your questions and answers to Ria at n2rj.com. That's Romeo India Alpha at November 2, Romeo Juliet.com. And I will answer your questions right on the show. Um, I'm also going to talk about some ham fest I'm going to be at this year. You know, we're going global this year, believe it or not. So I'm going to be at a few different events, including Dayton Hamvention and one other ham fest I've never been to, but I've always wanted to go to. But first, let's take a break and come right back. So in case you didn't know, Aria's Ham Shack is on YouTube and you can go to youtube.com forward slash at N2RJ. That's a YouTube channel where you can find a lot of great video content that's a companion to this radio show. You'll find the weekly Live with Ria streams. You'll find my general class licensing videos. You'll also find other interesting videos, news, tips, tricks, and how to get the most out of your amateur radio and other types of radio. I talk about GMRS, I talk about FRS, I talk about MERS, CB radio, whatever kind of radio. Even I talk about the FCC and the FAA and the kind of trouble they're getting into. Okay, right here on Ria's Ham Shack. Yes, we are Ria's Ham Shack. YouTube.com forward slash at N2RJ. YouTube.com forward slash at N2RJ. So first off, I want to apologize for last week. Last week, I got a cold and I couldn't do a show because I would sound really congested and coughing and I really didn't want to subject you to that. But let's talk about it this week. So last week, last show, I did mention that I left the ARL and I kind of left a cliffhanger saying I'm going somewhere else. Well, I have taken up a director's spot at none other than Amateur Radio Digital Communications or ARDC. And ARDC has been in the news recently because They've kind of um, made quite a stir in terms of their philanthropic activities. So they've been doing a lot of philanthropy. Um, Big words are tough, okay? And um, they have been funding a lot of projects in amateur radio and digital communication. So to describe them, ARDC stands at the crossroads of amateur radio and the Internet. ARDC was formed to manage the block of IP addresses that were uh, delegated to amateur radio for amateur radio use. So let me back up a little bit. If you're not internet savvy, IP addresses essentially are the quote-unquote phone numbers of the internet. So every piece of hardware, every device on the internet gets at least one IP address. Now, Um, In terms of um, whether these IP addresses are private or public, most devices in your home get a private address like a 192.168.1.5 or something like that. Whereas on the public internet, they get something a little more different. Like for example, 72.16.128.7 or something like that. So these um, IP addresses, they're kind of scarce now and this old system we have is called ipv4 they're kind of scarce and a lot of them are run out so what happened is you have a whole bunch of different people who need ip addresses to run uh cloud 
computing. So cloud computing is where they have servers available where you can buy time on to run your various applications. So one of these cloud providers bought a bunch of IP addresses from ARDC and um, they paid quite a good sum for it. And ARDC now has that money and is using that for to enrich the amateur radio hobby slash service. It is also using it to do a lot of and sponsor and fund a lot of interesting projects and a lot of things, you know, like um, CubeSats and um, uh, they even refurbished the, well, they're paying for the refurbishment of the MIT Radome, you know, and they're letting kids learn science and they're given scholarships to this is really good stuff, and this is something I always wanted to get involved in. You know, I was involved in the ARL Foundation when I was at the ARL, and this is a natural extension of that, so I get to do even bigger things, and I get to make influential decisions. So I'm very glad to be a board member of ARDC. Now, the nice thing about ARDC is that ARDC has global reach, and ARDC wants to be in the global space. So we're actually, um, some of the, the staff and the board members are actually going to various places globally. So of course I'll be at Dayton Hamvention this year and you can meet me there. Um, I will also be with um, the WRMI Legends there as well. Then I will also be at the AR ARDC booth. I'll be spending a lot of time there, you know, meeting and greeting people, talking about the good work that we're doing. But later on this year, in late June, I'm going to be at Ham Radio Friedrichshafen in Germany. So those of you in Europe who are listening in Europe, um, maybe we could meet up. You know, I'll be at Ham Radio Friedrichshafen in Germany. I'll be with ARDC. And my German's kind of okay. <laughs> Hoping to learn more before I go there. But I will definitely be there and I will definitely be talking to you if you want to listen, of course. Um, so drop me a line, Ria at n2rj.com if you plan to be there and maybe we can um, meet up. Other than that, you know, I've been kind of um, hoping to help them build up a lot of their um, outreach uh, with the outreach manager. So the outreach manager is John Hayes, K7VE. And, um, but I've also been um, kind of like um, funneling in my contacts to them so that um, ARDC can actually uh, reach out to more places and hopefully get a lot more projects funded. And of course, also um, teach people about the IP address space that we have because we didn't sell, you know, ARDC didn't sell all of it. We sold some of it, but we still have a lot available for radio amateurs to use. And these are public IP addresses you could use to route to the internet. So it's pretty cool stuff. They're really, and you know, what really, what I really like about them is that they're a really, oh, how should I put it? They're a very modern and progressive amateur radio and slash internet organization. They have their hearts in open source software like Linux and, um, you know, uh, GNU, which is basically used to build the GNU slash Linux operating system. I know some people will call it GNU is not Linux and okay, whatever. But, um, <laughs> and it's, uh, it's things I really care about. I've been in the Linux space since 1994 and I've really, you know, grown into it. I, I have a professional career doing Linux and I really, um, I really enjoy it. So yay. All right. What else is going on? You know, uh, I've been working DX and um, a little thing about that, ChatGPT is making quite a stir. So ChatGPT, as you know, is kind of this uh, artificial intelligence platform that people are using now to generate a lot of things. Like some people apparently use it to make college essays. Some people use it to answer questions on the internet. But I fear that with the use of these tools, what's going to happen is people are going to stop thinking for themselves. They're just going to depend on the chat GPT crop, cr uh, crutch. And then, you know, they'll stop thinking for themselves and it's all over. I don't know about this whole thing about AI, where AI is supposed to have some Terminator fantasy 
where or matrix fantasy where they use us all as batteries and you know that's our sole purpose and the they can basically they're super intelligent computers and they just put us um as a battery power source or they terminate us like the terminator terminator like arnold so yeah who knows but um this is going to be you know it's not gonna be a threat i'd say but it's something we need to be aware of i know italy has banned chat gpt for i think because they can't verify if the user is a minor i heard some other countries are starting to do it but um I don't know. But, um, you know, we need to be aware, you know, and we need to not give up our creativity. And in amateur radio, I think we still need to explore the traditional modes like SSB and CW. And not just fall into this FT8 robotic contact thing. I like talking to people on the radio. I like doing Morse code. Boy, do I ever love Morse code. I love uh, going on CW and running some CW pileups. I love working DX on CW. It is my favorite mode. And I will never give up CW Morse code. Of course, some people don't like it. Hey, that's their prerogative. But I love it. Uh, but, you know, there is a human element in there. And we need to keep that human element in there. You know, I still like Joe Taylor. Joe, Joe's my friend. And, you know, I think what he's doing is pushing the limits of propagation. I just think that we should not re- rely only on those. There is a, a D- D- expedition for Whiskey One Tango who's actually doing RTTY radio teletype. That's a mode you don't hear much about these days, right? RTTY essentially is now, well, now people use computers, but back in the day they used like teleprinters, which were, um, you find those in like the newsrooms and such like that. And, you know, you type on one and it would appear on another. So they've kind of um, been using computerized versions of that where you type text. And uh, it's really nice to see the expeditions using that mode again. Although I wish, you know, this has been a long-standing problem for a long time. I wish they didn't wait this long because before, even before FT8 took over, they only used RTTY during the expeditions and contests. Well, anyway, that's my uh, that's my <laughs> my spiel for this week. Hey, I'm gonna start talking German. Very nice to see that. Let's take a break and come right back. So, you know, one of the great things about having an HF radio is the ability to work DX. But you need to know where you can find this DX. And you can actually find all the latest news, tips, tricks, scuttlebutt, and on-the-scene reports at dx-world.net. That's dx-world.net. My friend Call and his fabulous crew of correspondents bring you all the latest DX news from around the world right into your ham shack. Okay, so check out dx-world.net. And they also supply the news here on Ria's Ham Shack. So if you want to get the source of the news, you go to dx-world.net. That's dx-world.net. One thing I did forget to mention is I will be at the National Association of Broadcasters Convention next week. Uh, I used to go off and on. But now I'm uh, I'm going this year again. It's the 100th anniversary. So if you're there, give me a shout. All right, let's talk about the news. And this week we start off with a, a bit of interesting news about an unusual de-expedition. So as you know, we get our DX news from dx-world.net. There are friends. Uh, Cole and his crew do a really good job. So check them out, dx-world.net. The, the recent FO stroke AA7 JV activation Pretty interesting, it, it, when, especially when it comes to possible future activations of rare entities or difficult IOTA. Uh, Yuri and 3 qq posted a comment given the above activity as displayed, and he said, um, Contacts made using radio, internet, or non-wire direct link from a land to sea based station or from a sea to land based station to facilitate or enhance signal transmission or reception will not count. So. Uh, in other words, um, FO slash AA7JV does not count for IOTA. Um, so, you know, some people are clearly having heartburn about this thing. So I'll, I'll back up a bit here. FO slash AA7JV is using the radio in a box concept. So essentially what they do is they have all these radios packaged up in a box, fully self-contained, and you just hook up antennas. 
and then you operate this thing remotely from a radio link or internet and it has a dishy so it has Starlink so you can operate this remotely and some people have had you know um, heartburn over remote operation I mean let, let's face it let's the elephant in the room remote ham radio run by Ray Higgins and Lee Ember and uh, W you know W2RE and WW2DX and the rest of them um, they have had controversy for many years okay even though the DXCC rules fully allow remote operation a lot of people say no it's cheating it's all stuff but you know um, you can't stop progress right and a lot of people are using that uh, regardless of what you think a lot of people are now using it to work DX and you know what it's one way to do it okay it's that's that's not throw the baby out with the bathwater but so some of these rules though like the iota is kind of still stuck in the past so Yuri's comment said personally I'm very much for such technology and building similar prototype the problem stated statement is we need to ask iota chases and activators opinion who makes and supports iota regarding activation rules the current edition of iota rules is outdated and lagging in time yes it is and the excellent rules for UK operators they live on the iota island but supporting this program for several decades and operating from very difficult remote islands, my conclusion is deployment time and team safety is something that has to be seriously considered. Um, proposal removed. BS about remote operations from Iota Island. B37 and everything around B3 portions as long as the equipment and antenna is on the island. Who really cares where the operator is? Does someone want to camp? No problem. Getting off from the island safely is always a problem. I would rather leave equipment on the island if weather's bad than a human being. Maybe need a letter to you out. I would limit it for consideration and open discussion. And this time, my friends, is the same debate we've been having. You know, and my personal opinion is that yes, we do need to update these rules, not only for human safety, but just because of technical in innovation. Um, it really does not make a difference if someone is off the island and operating a remote whereas they're you know on the island sweating it out on the island itself why are we continuing with these archaic rules i guess to please some of the old timers who figure well you know i walk two ways uphill in the snow and you should have to as well yeah okay i'm not against old timers by the way it was just you know just a term of endearment but i'll tell you what guys time marches on so do we it's time to embrace the concept even the ARRL in all its glacial glory has decided to embrace some of this there you go that is the gold standard speaking of the ARRL you know and I got to editorialize a little bit logbook of the world you might have been having some heartburn over logbook of the world which is basically the ARL and um, its system. I will tell you my personal opinion. My personal opinion is that they need to blow it up and start from scratch. There are people who will not agree with me, namely Dave A6YQ. He thinks that we should just, you know, continually <laughs> improve the thing. I think in parallel they need to develop a system and then migrate everything over to a new system and then shut the old thing off now I'm not saying this lightly okay I am NOT speaking as somebody who's just guessing let me tell you I will explain and, and this is not an appeal from authority statement I have done extensive things with public facing web applications that have user data and all sorts of other stuff I've been in the IT world, I've run large websites, I've built out infrastructure, I've designed things and I've run teams to do that. So I know a thing or two and I know what could happen. Look, I have, I've, I'm, I've been saying this for a long time, you know, logbook of the world is past the sell by date and there needs to be something done about the security, the certificates. <sighs> What can I say about that? I think it's a little too unnecessary to have all of this Fort Knox level security. Yes, you can still have security, 
but it does not need to be as obnoxious as Logbook of the World is. And you know what? It's not like David Minster or any of the others at the ARL can say, well, you know, she's just talking and she never offered to help. Because I offered to help and all I got were crickets. Too bad, so sad. Oh well. So speaking of disputed territory in amateur radio, you have the Spratly Islands DX uh, zero and E, and uh, they will have antennas for six meters. So you can check fifty dot three one three and fifty dot one zero two. Um, and pilot station Nick D one NA will send on outside worlds greetings info to an outside world goings on. Internet on the island will be spotty and may only be able to check messages sporadically, right? And um, they have a lot of uh, useful information here. Uh, Gil for F two KWT, he's going to be active as DX zero NE. Uh, the three Y zero J team has released their final PR with this final press release. The team want to express gratitude to all our sponsors that generally supported. The Bouvetoya adventure without the upfront support, this trip would simply not be possible. We announced today that we have decided to refund $50,000 of the donations to the DX community. One month before we departed Falkland Island, we informed the DX community that we had financed our budget. We have continued to receive a great amount of financial support up until now. This way we can reduce the $25,000 operator fee and at the same time, we're able to refund the DX community. We have decided to refund our lead sponsor, NCDXF, Northern California DX Foundation, with $40,000. Uh, initially, NCDXF supported the team with their largest grant ever, $100,000. It's with pleasure we can give back as much as 40% of the donation to them. We will distribute the rest of refund among our major club sponsors who all stepped up and donated generally, generously to this DX expedition. We will refund the following clubs and organizations with approximately 10% of their donation. GDXF, $3,000. Indexa, $1,000. ARL Colvin Award, $500. NIDXA, $500. FEDXP, $500. TCDXA, $500. SEDXC, $500. LADX Group, $300. Clipperton, $300. South Carolina, $300. Chiltern DX Club, $300. IOTA, $300. Delta DX Association, $300. All right, so this is from uh, Ken Opscar, LA7GIA, and Rune Oye, LA7THA, and also Erwan Marian, LB1QI, who is a co-leader. Uh, very good on them. And, um, you know, they, they I guess they've um, uh, done this on a uh, sort of a happy note. Good for them. And finally, the last bit of DX news I'm going to cover this week, the 4W1... TA uh, D expedition. They said that uh, they had very big issues with voltage on the public network. The voltage was collapsing, and they were in range between 130 to 285 volts. Operating with amplifiers was not possible anymore. Finally, we discovered that it was a factory close by. Their working hours are 7 to 17 local time, and at 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. local time. Now we are forced to run the generator at least during that period. Also, one possible problem with the audio in the K3 transceiver. We're about to try to see what we can do regarding that. So, yeah. They've also been running, as I mentioned, they run the RTTY um, mode there, too. So, uh, you know, that's one of the challenges of the expeditions. I remember they had one of these the expeditions to, I believe it was either Guinea or Guinea or Anobon, Equatorial Guinea or Anobon, where they were having problems with the voltage. You know, in some of these developing countries, they don't really have good power infrastructure. They have like um, their circuits are very overloaded, so they don't have good voltage. And when these guys go there with their transceivers and amplifiers, they find that they, you know, they encounter not just low voltage, but widely varying voltage. And this can cause a problem. I know some of these countries have money to run these big shortwave broadcast stations. So you got to wonder, okay? And they have money to fund their military too. Hmm. Hey, not my, not my, not my circus, not my, you know what. Okay. 
So as you may know, vacuum tubes are not really using a lot of electronics today unless you're talking about thousands of volts. Yeah, miles of wire and thousands of volts on RF transmitters. Or you're talking about guitar amplifiers where they use the 12 AX7. So this one's from Hackaday where they're talking about um, uh, the factory, this uh, Charles Whitner who has um, reshoring, he's trying to reshore at least one part of the U.S. vacuum tube manufacturing base. He purchased the Western Electric brand from AT&T and some of his remaining vacuum tube manufacturing equipment back in 1995. And he's been looking for people to try to build vacuum tubes. So now this factory located in Rossville, Georgia, they're manufacturing 300B power triodes and marketing them as a premium product aimed at the audiophile market. Um, $1,500, folks. Wowee. And um, he is going to start to produce the 12AX7. So um, the 12AX7 dual triode is going to launch this summer along with a host of other tubes. They'll be aimed at a much broader market, professional audio gear and guitar amps which have long coveted the sound that they swear only tubes can provide. Very nice. Well, you know, this is going to be a niche because, I mean, solid state pretty much rules the day. But um, vacuum tubes are still coveted for that warm sound and the warm distortion they provide with the guitar amplifier. So you can see the 12AX7 uh, up for a long time um, because, you know, it's all about the sound. So good luck to them. Now let's talk about space. And of course, NASA is always sending hams to various places. Um, it's because ham radio provides a good backup for the um, astronauts. But there are also a host of educational activities that they do with ham radio. So now NASA is, uh, of course, sending astronauts back to the moon. And of course, there are going to be three hams on that Artemis II moon mission crew which is going to be uh, Reed Wiseman, KF5LKT, Pilot Victor Glover, KI5BKC, and Mission Specialist 1, Christina Hammock Koch, uh, Mission Specialist 2, Jer Jeremy Hansen, KF5LKU. Uh, Koch had uh, planned to study and take her amateur license in 2019, but her flight was rescheduled six months, so she's going to, um, I don't know if she's going to get her ham license, but. It'll be cool if they make contacts, but I know their mission is a lot busier than ham radio, so it is, uh, it's nice to, to have hams in space. And it's one thing you always have to understand is that there's always going to be amateur radio in space because amateur radio brings the airwaves to ordinary people like you and I. And this is why amateur radio and the space program are a match made in heaven and why we should always support the efforts of those who bring amateur radio into space. This includes supporting organizations such as ARIS and um, you know the fine work that they do. You know my friend Rosalie K1STO uh, who is uh, she's the ARRL delegate to ARIS. Um, she takes a lot of pride in her work. All right, my friends, let's take a break and we'll come right back with Q&A. All the ways to listen to Ria's Ham Shack, let me count the ways. The first and the best way is, of course, on WRMI Legends 5050 on your shortwave dial and other frequencies as appropriate. You can also listen on the podcast wherever you get your favorite podcasts. You can listen on WRMILegends.com where we have it on the live stream. You can catch it on Rhea Hamshack YouTube channel. Just look for youtube.com forward slash at N2RJ. I publish a show and it's always a few days after it airs on WRMI Legends. And if you want to get the show first, you go on WRMI Legends 5050 shortwave or on WRMILegends.com. Of course, you can also go on WRMILegends.com to find out ways to support the show and support the station and to keep the tubes glowing 
and keep the fabulous shortwave programming coming. Now back to Ria's Ham Shack. So there is a, let's talk about the Q&A. There is a ham here who's asking, he said he wears hearing aids, but he do not wear them with a good headset. If he cranks the volume up on his ICOM 7300, he can't hear himself and he doesn't know what's that's hindering his speech. Is there a way to set the rig where he can hear himself talk and run the transmit? So most radios have the ability to monitor. Some of them make it easy. You just um, press a monitoring button on the front display and then turn up the volume so you can monitor and you're essentially hearing yourself speaking. Some radios make you dig in menus. I suspect the ICOM 7300 is one of those where you have to dig in a menu and you set up the monitoring. And of course you can increase the volume as much as you want. I can attend to turn it off because I'm confident in the way I speak. So I'm not really looking to hear myself talk and be self-conscious about it. But some people need it, okay? Um, I also find uh, monitoring to be a little distracting. So. That, but that is one control you need to learn on your transceiver. Next question. I need recommendations for NFED antenna wire. What insulation is best? So generally, as long as the wire is not shielded, uh, you could pretty much use any insulation. The only consideration you have to worry about is like the weather. So if you have something that's out in the sun, sunlight, you probably want something with a UV resistant jacket because the UV light is basically going to disintegrate that plastic insulation. So you look for uh, UV resistant, right? Um, I kind of, you know, for the NFED half wave, I mean, you can just use any old electrical wire or you could use bare copper if you want, but generally people just use uh, any old electrical wire. Okay. Um, so Zach here asks, for some reason I'm blanking hard on this, what's it called when some hams use their equipment to find someone's location, usually in reference to someone who shouldn't be on the air. Hmm. That, my friend, is called direction finding. So what they do is, there are several techniques for direction finding. One of them, of course, is to just go around with the radio until you find a stronger signal use directional antennas and see if you find a strong signal. That's certainly one way to do it. There's also a technique called time difference of arrival where you have a um, two antennas and a receiver basically just um, measuring the... Well, if you have two signals a at the same time coming together, they will, um, they will come in perfectly. Whereas if you're a little off center axis, you'll find that they uh, sound a little distorted. So time difference of arrival is a good way to do it. You can actually do it on HF if you have synchronized signals, but um, there's been a proof of concept with this by one of the SDR manufacturers. Uh, time difference of arrival. But generally, what hams do for HF, at least on HF, is they might have some of them in several different parts of, of uh, sometimes even the world, sometimes even a state or a town where they ask who is receiving the strongest so they get a general idea of where the signal is coming from. Of course, the colloquial name for this is fox hunting. I mean, you're not hunting an actual fox, but you're kind of, you know, looking for a hidden transmitter. You can either have, and these are, are um, uh, fun events. You can either do it as part of radio orienteering, which is the new name for amateur radio direction finding, and it's a very good activity to get out in the woods and get kids physical out there and running around looking for hidden transmitters. But um, it could also be used for, uh, you know, just basically any activity involving trying to find a transmitter's location. So this next question, I am a technician. Should I wait until I upgrade to general before getting into HF and six meters? Well, the good news is that around this time, we have the peak in the solar cycle where you can use your technician band privileges in what is known as a 10 meter band. So the 10 meter band, you have privileges as a technician. And if you use my book to study for technician, you will know that and you'll be able to just get on the air as a tech on HF. So if you are a tech, you can definitely get on HF now and now is a great time to do it because at the near peak of the solar cycle and apparently 
we are going to be at the peak soon. When you're at the peak, 10 meter band is open quite a lot. The 6 meter band also experiences all kind of weird propagation. So you'll be able to, to go far and wide with even just a technician license. So get on, uh, get your technician license and enjoy. Of course, try to upgrade to general and, um, and uh, you can work that as well. Now, of course, if you're outside the U.S., your, um, your licensing system might be different. I know in some countries they just have one license and they call it an amateur radio license. Some countries have different classes of license. Um, but if you have access to 10 meters, it's a great band to be on when because uh, it's nice and wide. And the top part of the band has FM on it too. So question here about 2 meter all mode radios. Um, and uh, looking for, actually this person is looking for a 2 meter SSB radio. All they're seeing is all band, all mode, instead of just UHF, VHF, all mode. Well, um, today it's kind of difficult, but there are a few VHF, UHF, all mode. There's the ICOM 9700, and there are other um, ICOM radios as well. But the thing is that today they kind of, yeah, they kind of just mash them all into one I guess it, it's better for radios to sell with all the bands and rather just have them be like a niche but the ICOM 9700 is a good all band um, well not all band VHF UHF radio the ICOM 905 is going to be UHF VHF and microwave and it's going to be a pretty interesting radio I think I want to buy one so Otherwise, you're going to be looking on the used market, okay? Um, so next question here. I'm looking for the best antenna for my car. Well, most likely 2 meter, but we'll take all suggestions. I recommend if you put a radio in your car and you put an antenna, if it's VHF, UHF, get a good dual band antenna. And if you're riding around in the city, you try to get like a quarter wave um, vertical. If you're outside in the boonies you know you want to get a 5.8 wave so you get like an antenna that has more gain whereas in a city you just want one that that looks uh, more up okay um <clears throat> question here um i have tried ferrite chokes on on the power supply ac and dc uh output and i have rfi radio interference caused by the condenser fan mode and the heat pump right and um so uh what you can do i mean there's probably not a lot you can do uh first of all uh, the awr lab has a lot of good tips on that so you can ask them but if you put um you put the ferrite beads just make sure they're not counterfeit that they also have the proper mix so that you can um you know notch out usually i believe you want mix 31 or 43 to, um, somebody could correct me on this to block out un unwanted currents. Now you can also get a filter that installs in line, but you know you have to be careful of the voltage and current that those can handle. Uh, what else? You know sometimes these manufacturers may realize that their devices are spewing RFI and they might offer you uh, a fix for free. Like for example, one time I had Cree light bulbs that there were horrific RFI generators. I, I basically emailed Cree and they sent me some brand new ones. And you know, no questions asked, but they did ask me for the old ones back because they wanted to analyze them, I guess. So this next question is about any recommendations on a good F HF antenna for small spaces. Small backyard, a G5 RV Junior is currently being used. One of the most helpful suggestions I've seen is a high hex beam. And you know a hex beam is actually a pretty nice antenna for small spaces if you could if you could pull it off because it's two elements essentially a two element beam and fits in small spaces so the way the hex beam works is that you have basically an inverted v and inverted m and those um <clears throat> those work like a yagi antenna you have them on various bands they're very nice to have they're very compact and um those work well. Other things you can do, you can use a 43 foot vertical if you can swing that. Um, you can also use um, a um, an NFED, right? NFED half wave, although I think that NFED's kind of becoming a fad now. 
but um, plenty of options to um, plenty of options to have small antennas. Well, here's a question I can <laughs> take a whole show to answer. So somebody here, Michelle Martin asks, I've heard of ham radio, kind of curious about it. What is ham radio? What's so great about it? What do you do? What would I need as a beginner to get into it? Well, so what is ham radio? So ham radio is basically citizen access to a wide range of spectrum, radio spectrum, and the purpose of which is to one, learn about radio communications, two, provide a pool of trained experts, radio experts, and um, people who are knowledgeable about uh, both the operational and technical phases of the radio art, and three, you know, provide some backup for emergency communications. Um, in no particular order, some people like to try to say that emergency communications is first, so it's most important. Uh, I don't know. I think that um, our value is much more than just emergency communications. What's so great about? Well, the greatest thing for me about ham radio is the fact that I can basically take, I can build a radio and use it. I can, um, I don't, I'm not restricted to a cell phone where I just buy something and I have to use it within their little box. No, I have the agility to do radio on my terms and do radio in a whole bunch of other places. That's what's so great about it. Some people say that how well, you know, you get access to all sorts of different frequencies to go uh, to do different um, things. And yes, I agree, so many different activities. What do I do? Well, I do, I'm mostly in the HF space. So I'm mostly dealing with international communications, also long distance communications within my country, which is the United States. So I do a lot of long distance communication. I do an activity called DEXing which is where I look to contact as many different countries and other places as possible. What would I need as a beginner to get into it? So you need, first of all, a ham radio license. Then uh, once you get the license, you probably need some kind of radio. I definitely do not recommend a handheld radio as the first radio for beginners. I think a lot of people get bored with them. Rather, I would save up for a good quality HF radio maybe like an ICOM 7300 and uh, you could check out uh, some of our sponsors here like main training company for those but um, the you get an HF radio and you're able to play on the bands now of course a VHF UHF radio yeah you should get one to communicate locally but I really don't use mine much anymore I don't get on local repeaters a lot of people don't get on local repeaters so it's probably better to get on HF where you nearly always have someone to talk to and that's pretty much it in a nutshell. I really love ham radio, you know, because of its ability to teach you things. I really, um, I learn a lot from ham radio. And even in Trinidad, we had people who are, you know, um, growing up in Trinidad, I had people who talk tech on the airwaves and I listened to them. So, uh, yeah, you know, <clears throat> uh, pretty interesting stuff. Okay, pretty sure if this has been asked before, does anyone have their call sign as a website? Yeah, I have n2rj.com and I have um, I have it there. I mean, I have a blog there, which I haven't updated in a while. That's pretty much what I have on it. So, and of course, um, I have email ria at n2rj.com. So this time here asks, um, does anyone program radios for others? They don't have a computer for chirp and they need about 40 to 45 channels programmed into the UV5R. Well, um, so you can program some of these radios via the front panels. Even Baofengs, you can program them via the front panel. That's one way to do it. But um, yeah, people do make what they call code plugs. So code plugs are basically computer files with a lot of radio configuration information in them and then you load them into your radio and you have all the memory channels and all the talk groups and such set up so that is one way you could do it there are people who offer this service uh, there and of course some of them are, are freely available 
as well too so you can have your your um, radios program usually I know there are um, people who if they sold you a radio you'd be able to um, uh, you'd be able to get it programmed for free another question are there any famous people who are ham radio operators? Well, there are quite a few. Uh, living and dead. Um, you know, uh, King Hussein of Jordan, JY1. He was perhaps one of the most famous ham radio people there there were, and he used diplomacy. Uh, Joe Walsh, WB6ACU from the Eagles. He was a guitarist from the Eagles. He's another one. You had King uh, Juan Carlos, EA, I believe he was EA1JC, King Juan Carlos from Spain. You also had Marlon Brando as a ham, uh, Patty Loveless, who else? Joe Taylor, the Nobel um, uh, Nobel laureate and physicist. So um, quite a few are are famous hams, you know. Um, <clears throat> Tim Allen, <laughs> yeah, who could forget him? K K six O T D. Art Bell, and uh, Art Bell was a good friend of uh, Ted Randall. So um, you know, Art Bell was a ham. W6OBB was his call sign. Um, who else was a famous ham? There was a whole list of famous hams. Uh, Owen Garriott, um, W5LFL, and um, Yuri Gagarin, uh, the first cosmonaut in space, and a few others, a good few others, who are uh, into ham radio. So now that we've talked Q&A to death, <laughs> Let's talk about the art of the conversation. <clears throat> and the art of the conversation, I think, is something that's been lost in amateur radio for a long time. And it's not just because of FT8. And, you know, poor FT8. People beat up on FT8 saying how FT8 is killing ham radio when it's really not. FT8 just reveals an underlying problem in that hams have forgotten how to communicate. And what do we mean by communicate? Well, you can get on and you can have a quote-unquote conversation and you can talk about politics and the weather and you could turn people completely off. Or you could do something interesting. You know, you can talk about various topics that pertain to not only radio but interesting things that you do. So back in the old days in Trinidad when I was the first licensed as a radio amateur not really that long ago by the way I was licensed in the 1990s in Trinidad and Tobago one of the things I enjoyed doing was listening to the old timers on a repeater at night talking about talking tech they're talking shop so they're there on the repeater and uh, two of the, the the really you know um, uh, prominent old timers were tech 9Y4 LP and also Arnim 9Y4 AR. And they were, they were longtime friends going way back. I believe they both worked at Cable and Wireless. I know Arnim did. He worked at Cable and Wireless for a while, and um, which is a telecommunications company. And they, they basically, um, you know, they talked a lot of, of tech. Like I would hear them talking about charging batteries, how to properly charge batteries. How to, uh, and Arnim was building an HF SSB uh, transceiver and he would describe his progress on the air. And, you know, he would have these nightly roundtable conversations. Very nice stuff. And I think, you know, we need to go back to that kind of ham radio nerdetry. You know, we need to go back to where people got deep into the radio. And they didn't just see ham radio as a tool for when all else fails or for prepping only or for emergency communications, God forbid you have some fun on ham radio. You know, God forbid that you actually learn to do something on ham radio. You see, that's what I'm talking about with conversation. Even DXing. You know, you can do DXing, you can work DX, and then, you know, you can still talk about w with things with various hams. I can understand DXpeditions, you run a pileup, but... I see like some of these other DX operations, people who are resident on various um, places. You know, you strike up a little conversation with them. You ask them how their day is doing. And uh, probably, of course, I guess uh, a lot of hands wouldn't describe their equipment. That's one way to do it. And this way you're, you know, they know what you're using. 
but you know you're still kind of like stuck after that we are the most anti-social social hobby there is no joke there are a lot of hams who kind of cringe at the thought of going out there and reaching out and touching someone there are hams who there are hams who willingly do it like i'm very outgoing i'm one of probably one of the more outgoing hams there are hams that are very reserved but they'll talk to you on the radio they'll talk to you on air um they might even talk at you on the internet but um you know they're they're there and um a lot of hams uh they're not uh you know they're not social well you know i guess you could go to the ham fast and you could see some of them and they're there at the ham fast you know at the ham fast i saw um there are a few characters at the ham fest one of them was this guy who got in trouble uh he was a subway quote unquote subway vigilante in the new york city subway he kind of got fed up of of being attacked in the subway and he ended up bringing a gun um illegally in the subway and um serving justice cold yeah and he is not a ham but he is a radio enthusiast and i always like to see radio enthusiasts as well too so he was um he was there and he comes to the ham fest you know all my friends they come to the ham fest and we talk but the nice thing i enjoy about going to ham conventions is that i meet hams and we talk with them in the after events like a date and ham convention sure i'm going to spend the day at the show i'm going to be in my booth i'm going to be talking to people hopefully um you know showing them a good time i'm going to be hanging out w- also with my friend uh, jim from chat radio and uh, maybe sign some books who knows uh we're going to hang out with wrmi legends and i was told that i have to stay at the table and sign books there which i don't mind doing so you know what i will sign books at um wrmi legends table as well too right And speaking of which, you know, this is a conversation. I love to have this conversation, but it's a two-way street, you know. You can always interact with me on social media. You can interact with me on um on the radio if you want to. I sometimes get on the radio. Like today I was talking to my friend um well yesterday I was talking with my friend Phil 280 PLA down in he's uh down in England. And I talked to my other friend Dave G0EVY. He's also in England. So, um yeah, lots of people to talk to. Uh ham conventions, like I said, I'll be at Dayton. I also be at Friedrichshafen. Love to meet some of my international audience at Friedrichshafen. They're um always uh, you know, always a hood. Um this is the first time I'm going to Friedrichshafen. And if you have any tips and tricks, you can email them to ria at n2rj.com. I've never been to Germany. I actually have never been across a pond. And I'm going to be um pretty excited to do that. But I'm a little scared because I've heard that sometimes some things don't work like like for example, the train stations don't take American credit cards. What's that all about? Well, I actually have a credit card that supposedly works with the chip and pin. So I'll be able to do that. and um yeah but you know it's going to be a good time and especially with ARDC we have a lot of um partners and a lot of projects that we work on with uh hams in uh Europe especially things like M17 which is a a, a neat digital protocol you know and a lot of the other little projects in the open source and uh internet and ham radio world that um are in Europe as well too. My friend Karsten of course, uh Karsten Dauer, uh DM9 Echo Echo. He is in Germany. I don't know if he'll be coming to the um the Friedrichshafen, but if he is, it'll be nice to meet up with him. I know he's coming to Dayton. He got some award this this year from Dayton Hamvention where he um you know, was doing service to the people of Ukraine where he was gathering supplies in germany and then he drove them across all the way from poland all the way to ukraine that's that's amazing and what an amazing humanitarian you know if you look on the podcast i did talk with him 
uh, early on in the series where I had him on my show and we talked um, a lot of stuff. So go check that out. Karsten, DM9EE. You can also look him up on Facebook too, Karsten Dower. And he has this cute little um, thumbs up thing called a Dower. And this is one other thing I mentioned about the art of conversation, by the way. You know, we Hams, we developed a lot of communications, a lot of um, uh, secret handshakes, so to speak. You know, and it's nice to have those. I, you know, it kind of puts you in a fraternity. At the same time, reach out to a new ham and show them, you know, that they're part of the fraternity too. Ham radio isn't all just about tech. It's about community, and you find community among the ham radio crowd. Next week, I will be at the National Association of Broadcasters Conference, the NAB show. It's the 100th show in uh, Las Vegas, and um, it's going to be pretty neat. One of the things I'm looking forward to is uh, hanging out with the legends. The legends will be there, too, (laughs) and um, it'll be pretty good. Uh, One other thing that they have at NAB, apparently they have a ham radio reception where the ARL section manager for Nevada, I believe, he sets up a a table, a booth, and um, I guess hams check in as well too. And they're able to go and, um, you know, they might have a ham radio reception. By reception, I mean uh, something where people get together. I don't mean reception as in receiving signal year 5-9. Well, we'll see. So... You know, I never paid too much attention to that, but uh, apparently it's there. If any of you are there at the NAB show, stop by and say hello. I'll be roaming the floor. I can't promise you that I will be anywhere in particular, but I'll be there. Well, my friends, this has been another Ria's Ham Shack right here on WRMI. And I will leave you with a special little thing. You know, I had one of these AI programs generate a rap, a ham radio rap, and it came out quite weird. So I'll play it and uh, you be the judge. And I'll tell you the most uh, scary yet um, interesting, curious thing about this rap is that it was generated entirely by AI. I mean, you know, I just told it um, rap about ham radio. There is an app that basically um, it, you know, it takes your input and generates a rap. Unreal. Take a listen. My skills in the airways, my signs loud and clear. I'm radio's the tool that brings me cheer. Nodding in the freeways, I'm in the zone. Sending out my transmissions, reaching folks I've never known. Morse code, voice, and data, it's all the same. My signal travels wide, no call sign to claim. I'm an operator, and every night I'm in the groove. Creating static, and I'm on a mission to prove. I'm the king of the airways, a master of the craft. Decode this transceivers and end in this, I have the neck. Friends all around the world, conversations about the news. My hobbies in the spot. And it's time to take it to the next level. Well, now you know why Italy is banned Chad GPT. That was interesting. That was also pretty awful. <laughs> We're not talking Dr. Dre or um, Tupac or who else? I'm looking for East Coast rapper. Yeah, you're not talking those guys. You're not talking um, LL Cool J or anything. But yeah, it's pretty interesting, okay? Anyway, my friends, another Ria's Ham Shack in the books. Until next time, you know, uh, it's springtime. Enjoy and uh, peace in 73.